sir. Good to see everybody here. Hey, I walked out the door this morning and stopped short. Can you believe this weather? It was so hot. I literally stood there and went, wow, this is what all feels like. Enjoy the 24 hours that you have it because it's going to change. But I also got to thinking that, man, I'm so glad that somebody put all this together and I began to think about the majesty of God, which is perfect because this morning's first song is going to talk a little bit about that. And it reminded me of Psalm 8. This is my go-to anytime I'm thinking uh, how big God is and how small I am. Listen to this from Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what are mere mortals that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? This is a God who is so vast that he can put together a perfect day and hold everything in unison for perpetuity. And yet, he cares for us. I think that's cause to celebrate. Will you stand and sing with us this morning? Well, good morning, Word Surf. How are we doing this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I got a couple of times too. This is good. Well, as Bill said, we just have something beautiful that we need to celebrate this morning. So I encourage you, I know I said this before, but you know, a football team that you love and grew up in the city you grew up in, and you just love, you know, and scream and cheer and throw stuff and get mad and kick over or whatever, you know, just so animated and excited about whatever. But yet we can sit here and say that the God of the universe calls us friend. I think that's worth much more, a hundred thousand times the celebration of wood for somebody kicking a football. And I love my city, so I'm very proud of that guy who shoots a football. But I tell you, I think that we have so much more to celebrate this morning. Amen? Amen. So can we just rejoice? Can we lift the holy praise this morning? Come on, guys.
celebration. We just lift that cry this morning. We lift that thank you, God. Thank you, God, that in all your perfection, in all your majesty, that you would take joy, you take delight in calling us your friend, calling us children of the one true living God. What a beautiful truth we celebrate this morning.
presence this morning that we need to have in life. Your word, the Bible, is full of places where you told people, just watch, I'm going to do a miracle. And they said, no, not for me. It didn't turn out the way I thought it would. It's not working. And then you deliver this miraculous way. And then they look back and say, all along we saw you were moving. You're always right on time. It's us, we're impatient. We fear, we try to control. Where is it right now that you need that reminder that his love never fails? That it never runs out. You cannot possibly exhaust the supply of mercy, the supply of love ever flowing through the vine, through the spirit. The one living God, from the one who knit you together. In these moments, let us not rush through them. God, help us to just take this time to pause and say, This is for you. I stand here with us right now in your home online. I'm here, God, to meet you. I'm here, God, to take my schedule and put it on hold. so much more than one hour a week. Everything is the start and the beginning, so in this moment, let's just make this hour special. So where do you need that love this morning? Where do you feel like it's been forgotten? Just encourage you right now in these moments just to just put that to the front of your mind, in front of your hearts. He wants, he's eager to hear Concerns of his children. God is in throne upon the praises of each and every one of us as we shout that his love never fails, as we sing that one who remains and we rest in. I'm going to ask Chad if we can put the bridge to this song back up. In death and in life, if we could just sing that together this morning, just gently. I love the bridge to this song. Every time I do it, I always think, do we realize what we're singing? Are we confident and covered this morning by the power of His great love, or are we singing it because it's up there? Do we sing my debt is paid. That's that celebration. That's that joy. No matter, we all, we all know what we've done, where we've been, who we've hurt, where we've messed up. There's nothing that can separate. So we just lift this praise this morning in death and life. I am confident. I am covered. In death. Fails and 
never gives up, it never runs out of me.
you are really inviting us into this story. It's not really my story, it's your story. But it becomes my story because of your son, Jesus Christ. As you invite us into fellowship through reconciliation, by faith, and by your grace. God, help us to live out that story in a way that points back to you and your story. God, transform us this morning and open our eyes and ears to see what you have for us, to hear what you have for us. More importantly, to live your story.
So I'm going to fill you in, uh, fill you in on a little background, talk about what happens next week, which is the church vote, and uh, leave room for questions and answers. So stay put, we'll chat afterwards. Uh, other things going on, let's see. Speaking of that vote, uh, we do have uh, the vote on October 9th. This is for members, so you have to be a member of Wurzer. It'll be at 6.15 to about 7.15, and I say that because uh, we've got to get the district superintendent out of that vote over to this vote. So what can you expect on next Sunday night? At 6.15, we're going to start with prayer and graves. Uh, this is a, a, a thing that we've been wanting to do for a while, where we just have a prayer and praise service. So there'll be some music, there'll be some prayers. As we uh, try to attune ourselves to God's will, there will be ballots that will be handed out and written, and uh, you will need to mark the ballot. So we're asking people to pre-register, and, and that is also an RSVP of sorts. Uh, the reason that we're asking you to do that is if someone registers and they're not a member, then we need to contact them and say, hey, did you know that you're not a member? Because uh, that's kind of important. Uh, also, if there's somebody that's missing that we would expect that would come to vote, we would reach out to them and say, are you aware that there's a vote? Uh, this is kind of historic. In fact, this is one of the most historic things that happened in the Methodist movement since 1844. Uh, so if you want to be a piece of history, you come out Sunday night. Uh, I'll explain this again in more detail, but basically we're, we're going to have a, uh, a ballot that has some legalese on it. So uh, unless you're a lawyer, you may not understand it, but let me make it very simple for you. If you vote for, it means we will leave the United Methodist Church and go to the Global Methodist Church. If you vote against, it means we remain in the United Methodist Church. It's about as simple as it gets. I'll explain a whole lot more in the town hall meeting if you have questions about that, obviously. And we'll explain it again that night. But I want to make it as simple as can be, and we'll talk about uh, more ramifications of that in the town hall. All right. I think that's enough of me. Um, so, hey, how about we pray? Let's pray. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for your love that surpasses everything, covers a multitude of sins. God, I especially want to pray this morning for the people who have been devastated by uh, Hurricane Ian. Uh, we know what that's like, having uh, been here through Harvey and uh, maybe even other storms, if we've been here long enough. We know what it's like to, to feel helpless and powerless, to see life dreams washed away, literally. We know what it's like to wonder where the next meal might come from or if we're going to have water to drink. We know what it's like to wonder how will we ever rebuild this home that we poured everything into. God, I'm thankful that there are people there on the ground already that are helping not only to restore the homes, but to restore souls. I pray that this would be a, an opportunity for people to see beyond the simple material things. As I've heard so many people say on the news, uh, I'm still here. I still have my family. And God, that helps us put our priorities straight. They, these are just things. These are temporary things. And while they're important, they're not the most important. God, I pray that we would speak into that. That the, the people who are on the ground would share not only their resources, uh, but their love for you. And I pray that the hunger that people feel, uh, how can I possibly be whole again, will be answered by the only way that we can be whole again your son Jesus Christ. God, I pray for uh, all the rescue, the first responders, that we keep them safe, and that they would do whatever needs to be done, and that they too would be whole again, you know, based on what they see or, or what they experience. God, it is a tragedy, no doubt, but as we mentioned today, there's a love that is greater that cannot be exhausted, that cannot run out. Pour that out on that community and on us. Pray this in Jesus' name. We're in a new, relatively new, sermon series called The Way Forward. Appropriate, because we're about to vote to determine the way forward. It's almost like somebody thought about that. I don't know. Uh, the Way Forward goes like this. Last week we talked about our mission. We're going to talk today about our values. And then we're going to talk about our vision, our leader. And then I thought it would be appropriate to stir up a little home and family spirit with We Are Word Serve. So that will be the wrap up to the series. Uh, today we're going to start with our values, and if you think about it, values uh, really determine what we do. And, and if you are a Facebook or Instagram follower, you saw a post yesterday that said, what does your to-do list say about your values? Because we can say we value certain things, but unless
unless we were actually doing them, is it really a value? Or is it just a, are we saying that because we think we should say that? Are we believing that because we think we should believe that? But we really do other things. See, there's a reason that we have pithy sayings like actions speak louder than words. Because what we do reflects what we value. I don't know how many people are familiar. How many people have heard of Simon Sinek? Awesome. This will go well. So, <laughs> he's, he, I wouldn't expect you to. Uh, he's a leadership expert, a secular leadership expert. He's also British American. I thought I'd throw that out for you all. Uh, he has done, he, he started a seminal work in 2009 called Start With Why. And he talks about business leadership psychology and, and marketing and selling primarily, but there's some serious spiritual principles I want to pull out today. Here's a picture of Simon uh, given one of his famous speeches. And the thing that makes it unique is he, he always says, start with why. If you think about the, the, the question why answers what it is you value. Why do you do what you do? If you get to that question, you found what you value. And he says, I don't know if you can see this, these three circles that he's drawn, the outmost circle says what? So he's talking to business organizations, but I'm talking to the body of Christ. So just make that little jump with me. What do you do? And then the next circle up is how do you do that? And he's talking strategy primarily. And then the center of the bullseye is why do you do that? And he says that we often communicate from the outside in, and especially in, in business and marketing, but I would also offer we communicate from the outside in when we try to make disciples. Think about this. Uh, and think about something that you've really bought into. Like, I'm committed, die hard, I will do this no matter what. I bet you have penetrated the out, outer two layers and made it to why. Because if there's, just think about that thing that you're really bought into. Somebody told you what it was. You probably figured out how to do it. But you've also probably answered, why do I do this? Why is this important to me? And if you've answered it, I bet you're still doing it. And if you haven't answered why, I bet you're not doing it anymore, or you do it sporadically. Are we registering? Is this resonating with people? Uh, okay, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, I'm going to use church speak here for just a second. What do we do for a serve? Serve? We make disciples, and we serve. That's true. We make disciples. That's what we do. How do we do that? Hey, good one. They're 
sowing seeds of dissemination. They're, they're sowing dissent in, in the church. So John is writing to say, hey, look, stick with what you know. Uh, Jesus is Lord and Savior, and there's a most important thing. So as I read these, I want you to see if you can pick up on what the common theme that John is using to counteract false prophets and false doctrine. See if you can pick up on it. He says, turn the right spot. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete. I'm skipping ahead to verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If we say we love God, yet hate a brother or sister, we are liars. For if we do not love a fellow believer whom we have seen, we cannot love God whom we have not seen. And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love one another. These are the words of God for the people of God. And for these words, we are grateful. Do you pick up on a theme there? What would be the theme of John's counteraction to this false teaching of false prophets? God is love. Right? God is love. That's as simple as we can make it. Absolutely. Um, but here's the thing. It's not just love like we think of love. Like, I love pizza. That's not what he kind of loves. Uh, I love sports. It's not the same thing. God's love. And how do we pick up on this? First of all, uh, I want to point out there in the very last verse that we read, verse 21, he has given us a new suggestion. He has given us a new idea. No, he's given us a new command. There's no option. There's no wiggle room here. If uh, those who love God must also love one another. So we've got to figure out how do we love one another the way that God loves. So the next logical question is, well, then how does God love? What does that mean? What is God's love? And how do we love with that? I want to float back to verse 10 for just a second because to me this is the key to the whole thing right here. This is the why if you're looking for it. Here's verse 10 one more time for you. This is love. See, John's not mincing any words. He's not going, you know, wishy washy, you're going to know this is love. If you ever question, this is it. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Sometimes when we, when we read the words in the Bible, uh, they, they don't really make sense because we don't use these words today, like atoning sacrifice. What is an atoning sacrifice? Well, an atoning sacrifice, you know, I think we get the idea of sacrifice, but the atoning part. So if you've ever wondered what the word atonement means, picture the brain, uh, picture the word in your brain, atonement. A-T-O-N-E, mint. All right, now break the word apart. At one. Mint. That sacrifice makes us at one. That sacrifice takes us from the broken, fallen, distant relationship that we had and brings us back together as one. That's an atoning sacrifice. And there's only one. And that is Jesus Christ. So this is love. This love doesn't say, hey, you know, whatever, whatever it goes. No, this love is, this is a broken, fallen world, and I'm going to make a way back to me through my son Jesus Christ. So if you want to know why we should follow Christ, think about this. Even Christ had a choice. Even Christ asked questions. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what was his most famous question? Is there any way that this cup can pass for me? And yet, Christ chose love. Christ chose to be the atoning sacrifice for us. If that's not a reason to follow Christ, this one who came from heaven, who had everything, who was worshipped, who had glory, had no limitations whatsoever, assumed a human form in all its misery, had to deal with 12 knuckleheads for three years, 
And I mean that. I mean, if you look at the interactions, occasionally you can sense that Jesus gets a little tired of the disciples not getting it and says things like, come on, really? Do you still not get it? These are things that Jesus said. I'm paraphrasing, but these are things that Jesus says. He's frustrated, but he chooses this atoning sacrifice. He chooses to come not even knowing that people will accept it. Did Jesus convert everyone to follow him that he came in contact with? No. Does Jesus' death mean that every person in the world is going to accept that death and be saved? No. Why would the, the Prince of Peace, the, the Son of the Living God, come down and suffer all this misery, not even knowing if you're going to accept the gift that he offers? Why don't we come up with one answer? That's a, a love that I can't understand. But sure I'm grateful for it. I want that love. God's love changes. Maybe you've experienced this. And if not, I encourage you to reflect on your life, and I'll bet you have. God's love can change relationships. Relationships that have been damaged, relationships that have been severed, relationships that are hard. God's love can change that. God's love can change addiction. I've seen it. I've seen people who are hopelessly addicted. Going down a road that you know is no good. And for some reason, you know, whatever the psychological or the medical treatments, I'm not downplaying those. Those are important, too, as part of a holistic approach to getting well. But you know, the number one thing that always amazes me is when a former addict comes and says, I don't even have the desire anymore. I don't know how that happened. And, and that's usually the point where I say under my breath, I don't know how it happened. You found God. You found Christ. God's love changes things. God's love doesn't come and say, do whatever, do, you know, be yourself. Uh, every, every time that God interacts with someone and he seeks out that lost person, it's always for the point of reconciliation and bringing back the at one meant. And it cost him his life. How could you not love that? I can't not love that. God's love doesn't necessarily change the circumstances. The circumstances may still be bad because we live in a fallen world, but God's love changes your perspective on those circumstances. God's love can change your outlook on those perspectives. <clears throat> God's love changes everything. That is our value. <clears throat> that is our value as Jesus follows. God's love. The love that changes everything. Now, specifically at WordSurf, you may not be aware of this, but we do have a whole strategy in Sarge for the eye test that I, I would be happy to hand it out through. You can find it probably on the website. Um, we actually have values, and don't you know they spell out serve? I'm just making this up. So here's the values as, as we see them. Uh, the S stands for seeking God's will is our first priority. And that's love. That is priority. And the Bible even says in Matthew chapter 6, seek what? First, the kingdom of God. And all these other things that you worry about will be added to you. That's priority. That's, that's why. Embracing transformation is God's ultimate work. Transformation makes us new. It doesn't just make us an upgrade a little better, like Bill version 2.0. No, it makes me feel new. New in Christ. Why do we struggle so much against this transformation? And I'll tell you why I did. It was right. I, I kind of liked what I was doing. I liked who I was, independent of Christ. And there was just a few problems with that. That's not the way I was wired. And it wasn't going to go well if I kept going in that direction. Embrace the transformation. Let Christ do his work in you. Let the Holy Spirit shape you and move you. Become new, not just upgraded. The R stands for risk-taking, sacrificial worship. Risk-taking. Do you think Jesus took risks? You think the disciples took risks? You think the early church took risks? Man, we are one of the most risk-averse organizations I know. Let me prove it to you. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I just want you to ruminate on this. I just go to talk to somebody about Jesus. What? That, you, you can't do that, right? That's, that's too much. That's asking too much. Jesus on the cross, I'm sorry, you're asking too much of me to talk about you? Are you kidding me? Now, we'll justify that. Oh, people are alienating me. And? Or, or uh, 
uh, I don't know enough. Who did Jesus recruit for his disciples? Rhodes scholars? Everyday people, just like us. Well, I can't talk about that work, there are policies. Fair enough. I don't want to get you fired, that's not my goal. But you know what you can do? Remember what we said earlier, actions speak louder than words? Well, why don't you just live your testimony? People are going to notice. And people are going to start asking. Now, if they ask you, that's different. Hey, you ask me, I'm answering your question. I'm talking about Jesus. I can't come out and say that at work because of policies, but I can certainly respond to your question. And you can certainly see a different life. Life is different. But it's risky. You might not get invited to all the parties. You might not be on the Snapchat, Facebook, or Instagram, whatever. <laughs> That's the best I can do. <laughs> B, vibrant relationships is life-giving community. This is one of the things that we're seeing right now. And I'm not talking relationships like, how's everything going? Fine. That's not a vibrant relationship. That's a polite relationship. We don't have to be polite when we're with family. You know that, right? That words are vibrant relationships. Me, if I'm having a bad day, I can talk about that. If I'm having a question about my faith, I can ask that question. And nobody's going to ostracize me or throw me out this door or never talk to me again. If I'm struggling with work, with uh, my family, with my relationships, whatever, I can talk about that. That's a vibrant relationship. That's a life-giving relationship. This isn't just a, hey, how you doing? Everything's fine. Plastic smiles organization here. This is real life. And it can be vibrant. Finally, elevating others is God's masterpieces. One of my favorite sayings is the rising tide lifts all boats. There's enough trash talk. There's enough division. There's enough polarization. There's enough tearing down in society today. We don't need to add to that. In fact, we need to count. God's love can change that. God's love can change the way I think. God's love can change the way I speak. God's love can change the way I act. Maybe it's time that we adopted that kind of love. And if so, maybe we found our, our why, our value. Because if you go out to ask people, uh, you know, let's just take an example. I want these fine young people that I met in a coffee shop, not really, it's a soft fruit. <laughs> But pretend with me, right? Hey, uh, I would love to tell you about words or who we make disciples. We read the Bible, we pray, we uh, we schedule things like service projects and, and we do community groups, so that's more stuff on your calendar. Wanna join us? Who's gonna take me up on that offer? Yeah, nobody. So let's back out and instead of talking from the outside in, let's talk from the inside out. Let's start with why, as Simon Sinai says. Hey, God's love changes everything. But let me tell you about a time in my life where God's love changed everything. And tell your story. Tell how God has changed you. God's love changed my relationship. God's love changed these things that I was struggling with all these years. I, I feel like a burden has been lifted from me. I feel free. I don't feel guilt and shame anymore because God's love changes that. You know how I, I discovered that? I, I met with some people and I read the scripture and I prayed and I felt that God's love was making a difference in my life. And in that whole process, this is what we do at Word Service. We pray and we get together and we meet and we talk about these things. And in the process, we, we learn to follow Jesus and we obey his commands so we make disciples. Want to join us? Do you sense the difference? No. Okay. <laughs> yes. It changes everything. I'm telling you, if you start with why, not only will you do it when nobody's looking, but it will transform you. It won't make you version 2.0. It will make you new in Christ. That's what the world needs now. The world needs love. God's that love. Thank you for Jesus Christ who modeled that love, that perfect love. Thank you also for his sacrifice, the one that makes us at one once more who will accept that gift. God, help us to live fully into that. Help us to understand what you've done for us. And help us to love, not follow out of duty, not focus on what and how to the detriment of our relationship with you, but focus on the why. 
your love. The love that surpasses understanding and gives more than you got, for sure. In the hopes that we would respond. God, may we respond this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As Jesus gathered around the table on that night, he knew exactly what he was doing, even though the disciples didn't. He was about to show them the love that would change everything. At that table, he made it very clear, in retrospect, what was about to happen. As he took the bread and he gave thanks, he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Christ, who was whole, was made broken, so that we who are broken might be made whole. The body of Christ. After supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them and said, Take and drink. This is my blood poured out for the sins of many. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Christ, who was full, was made empty, so that we who are empty might be made full. The blood of Christ. Will you pray with me, please? God Almighty, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I invite the surfers to come forward at this time. And as they are making their way forward, I want to remind you that this is not my table. This is not even Wordsworth's table. This is the table of Jesus Christ. He invites all who earnestly desire to turn from what keeps us from Christ bring back to Christ, to live fully in God's love, through the acceptance of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If there's anything that prevents you from this, that this morning, I would encourage you to take a moment and pray, lay it at the feet of the Savior, and trust me, it's already covered, whatever it is that you've done. Come as you are able, to the one who invites you to be that one.
We stand in conviction this morning. Amen. Come on. We lift this truth. We lift this praise. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning.